I'm just going to start by saying, aren't we all sick and tired of going into a room full of academics and have them say to us, oh, improvement science, that's soft science. So I'm an academic, and I'm really pretty sick and tired of going into my colleagues' meetings and having them tell me I do soft science. So we're going to deal with that today, and I hope I'll give you uh, kind of a vocabulary and some tools that you can use to design and evaluate improvement programs that will stand up to that kind of scrutiny and also you, allow you to have a reasonable dialogue uh, with uh, people who are skeptical. Here's the roadmap for what I'm going to try and do. Uh, first, we're going to briefly talk about what science is. I know, I know you all know what science is, but it doesn't hurt just to give it uh, a definition. And then we'll talk about how we can be confident uh, that the outcomes we're observing are actually attributable, and you'll notice I put a lot of words in green, I hope you can see that, uh, when I want to emphasize them, uh, how our, what we're seeing is attributable to the changes we're making and the programs that we're implementing, and how can our claims be more credible. And I'm going to talk a fair amount about association versus causality, and for those of you who don't know Hill's criteria, we're going to go over them in a bit of detail. Uh, and uh, talk a little bit about how we can get it wrong when we say that what we've done has caused a certain outcome. Uh, and we'll talk about evidence and degree of belief and how confident we are about what we've learned. And if there's time, we'll briefly talk about some rigorous uh, ways to design improvement programs. Uh, I'm not going to talk about driver diagrams and logic models. In fact, there's a fair amount in this talk uh, where if you want to learn more, I've given you the references and you'll have to dig deeper just because this is, by its very nature, got to be a somewhat brief uh, talk. But please look at those references. The slides are all going to be posted. Slides that I'm not showing are hidden and will be available to you uh, when you look online, so you'll see them there. Uh, I'm not going to talk about driver diagrams and logic models, but they are the essence uh, of what we call program theory about our belief in what causes the outcomes we'd like to achieve. So science, the scientific method in brief, is to formulate a testable hypothesis or a theory, uh, specify the outcome you expect if your hypothesis is correct, perform iterative experiments, collect data and study results, update your confidence or your degree of belief in your hypothesis, and then implement your idea or, based on the data, revise it or abandon it uh, because of the experiments you've done. So that ought to look really familiar because it is scientific improvement, which is based on a hypothesis, setting a theory, prediction, iterative learning through experimentation, observation, and then action based on analyzing your results. And that's pretty much what a PDSA, Plan, Do, Study, Act cycle is. So first of all, when somebody says to you, you're not doing real science, don't be intimidated because it is the scientific method if done uh, properly. So I have a personal grudge against people who invent new terms for this. Uh, so I've called it improvement science today, but you're also going to see healthcare delivery science, implementation science, system strengthening, uh, and now learning health system science with its own journal and society, and now uh, engagement sciences, which I didn't even know existed till the other day. All of these sciences come from the same roots, and they have much more in common than they have differences between them. So I think we shoot ourselves in the foot. We use all these different terminologies to advance our own careers, I suppose, or our own publications, our own journals, our own societies. We should be working together to unify in what's an emerging and important field that most people think is soft. So scientific methods I've put up there, obviously from IHI, we talk a lot about the model for improvement, but don't get hung up on that either. All those methods come from the same scientific roots. Now I'm going to mention briefly implementation science because it's kind of taken over the official language in the United States. If you want a government grant to, to do work in improvement, you've got to call it implementation work. And there's a 1,200-person meeting that will soon be the size of this one on implementation science in Washington. I've given you one widely used definition. There are many of these, but again, it ought to look familiar. We're trying to promote the uptake of research or evidence in real work settings to improve quality of care and population health. If we put cost in there, it would basically be the triple aim. So again, very similar to what we're trying to do.
This is really an emerging field. If you look closely at that little inset down the bottom, there's a journal, there's a society, uh, there are professors of implementation science, but there are some nuanced differences that I want to point out. Implementation scientists talk a lot about implementation outcomes, and I didn't know what they were uh, two years ago. But they're actually very useful. There, there's a slide you'll see posted that I'm not going to show because of all the detail on it. But it's basically things like fidelity. What's fidelity? Did we implement with fidelity, faithfully, according to specifications, uh, the intervention of the way it was meant to be uh, done? Uh, and that's fidelity. Did we give the right dose, the dose of the intervention we said we'd give? Was that dose received? Did it penetrate? In other words, did people widely uptake what we were saying and embrace it and put it into their uh, work. It, was it sustainable? These are not novel concepts, but in my experience, when I look at a lot of big improvement programs, spe specifying the outputs and outcomes of activities, big activities are often not really specified or measured. And I think that's a big mistake that we can learn uh, from the implementation scientists who go crazy over that kind of thing. There's probably a few in the room by the way, you're free to rise up and protest if I say anything incorrect about implementation uh, science. The implementation scientists also uh, talk a lot about context. Now, I know in improvement, we're always talking about context. We have to adapt to the context. We are not, in general, that great at measuring context. We talk about it, but we don't really describe it in ways that can be easily summarized and published and defended. Uh, unfortunately, if you try and look for practical tools to measure context, it's really tough. The most widely used one, at least in the United States, is the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Science. And I've given you the toolkit uh, there as a uh, hot link if you want to go to it. The trouble is, even though I agree with everything in that framework in terms of the constructs and the things they look at, it's almost impossible to take it and use it in a practical way in the kind of improvement that we're generally doing. And one of the great challenges for us and for implementation scientists working together is to make it easier and more simple to look at the main elements of context in a way we can actually do in practice. So just keep that in the back of the mind. I, I sometimes say that uh, implementation scientists, and with apologies, wallow in context. There's so many posters that they're meeting about contextual assessment and very few, if any, uh, went through 100 posters and saw one run chart. So can't wallow in context. Important to know it, to adapt to it, and to measure it, but not to wallow in it. Uh, implementation scientists usually favor randomized designs. We'll talk a little bit about that. And they're really strong on behavioral science. Now, we talk about psychology of change, one of the lenses of Deming's profound knowledge, but we're not generally using, in my opinion, behavioral science and behavioral economics uh, the way it's evolved in recent years. So how do you make your academic and research uh, colleagues comfortable with improvement science. Well, I've had a lot of experience doing this and I always remind them it's just the experimental method plus some hefty doses of systems thinking, uh, behavioral science, and insistence on graphing data over time to show how things are improving or not improving uh, as the work goes on. And, and I, I got comfortable with this by doing, and you don't have to do this, but I did 10 years of laboratory research trying to develop a vaccine for staff, for MRSA, basically. And I worked with a PhD scientist, and what did we do? We had a theory that a certain polysaccharide on the cell wall of a staphylococcus would be immunogenic, that if we injected into animals, or hopefully man, antibodies would be made that would protect the animal and people against staph infection. So that was our theory. We had the stuff in hand that was pure. Now we had to do a series of PDSA cycles or experiments to find out what the right dose is to give an animal to get an antibody response, to find out if those antibodies could kill bacteria, to figure out if we could have an animal model of a staph infection where we could actually show it worked. We did scores and scores of iterative PDSAs along the hypothetical causal pathway from a polysaccharide to protection against staph. That is exactly what we do in improvement. People out there will say, well, that's not like a ward. I can tell you, the laboratory in which I worked had a lot of psychology going on and a lot of issues around psychological safety. The animals are very sensitive to changes in the environment. It, it, they're, it's more analogous uh, than you think. The one thing we did that not many improvers do, 
I think you'll probably agree, they don't keep a lab book. They do their PDSAs and maybe they'll sketch something down, but if you go back and try and find out what they learned about context, what experiments they ran, it's not like in the Staphylococcal laboratory where somebody could go in and see exactly what we did, exactly what we learned, and exactly why we did the next experiment. So that's a little bit of deficiency and obviously very labor intensive, we're not a lab, uh, but uh, it's something to keep in mind if we want to be credible. To accelerate improvement, I'm a strong believer in incorporating other scientific disciplines into improvement science. We do not own the science of improvement. We should be working with behavioral scientists, ethnographers, anthropologists, qualitative researchers. Increasingly, we're going to know, need to know more about data analytics and even artificial intelligence. Network science, incredibly important in looking at relationships for learning and relationships for spread and scale up. Health economics, I'll tell you, if I go into a major health system in the United States and I, and I don't have somebody by my side who can run the numbers and show that what I'm doing really is cost saving, I'm not uh, uh, believed a, a lot of the time. And most of all, and especially because I'm an epidemiologist, I think epidemiology has a lot to teach us. And I, I thought that most improvers actually knew uh, these fundamental concepts, and I think a lot of you do. But I was in our, uh, I guess our signature improvement science training program, the Improvement Advisor Professional Development Program with 24 students taking a nine month uh, uh, course with us. And I said, how many of you have systematically uh, thought about bias in your current work? And one hand went up and he'd just gotten his MPH. And when I asked about confounding, which we'll come back to in a minute, it was the same story. So even though we may think we're doing these kinds of things and considering bias and confounding. In general, I, I don't see it. I didn't see it in the posters. I went through about a hundred of them today and I didn't see any discussion really uh, of bias in a, in a disciplined way. So I'm not being, by the way, critical of you or myself. This is just the reality that we need to address if we're going to uh, uh, talk to fellow scientists in other disciplines. Scientists in these other areas love it when we call. I have never in my life and career been turned down by a scientist in these other areas if there was a promise of seeing what Boston Children's Hospital looked like and working on something that could make patients healthier or save them from side effects. They flock. It's just we don't ask them. The, the gulf between these other scientists and our scientists is just too, too great and we need to address this by opening our hearts and uh, inviting them into our work. Now, building evidence for what works uh, is important, obviously. Improvers should always be asking ourselves, how confident are we really that the change we're implementing will work in practice to improve uh, quality? How strong is that evidence? Uh, and if we don't have strong evidence, what level of consensus and belief do we have as a, uh, as a group? Uh, evidence and the degree of belief are critical in both clinical medicine and in our own work and in life. This is my dad, Judge Sidney Goldman, head of the, of the appellate division of the Superior Court of New Jersey, who has passed on. And this is Judge Sidney Goldman with my daughter Elizabeth, who's about, uh, well, I don't need to give her age in this, but she's much older than in that picture. Uh, and, and why did my father die? He died because of colon cancer. And we knew when I was in training, certainly while my father's alive, that you could measure blood in the stool pretty easily. And if you found blood, you probably ought to go do further exploration. At that point, the uptake of that evidence, and certainly its implementation at scale, was pretty feeble. And today, I mean, I get colon, I hate colonoscopies, but my dad died of colon cancer, I'm getting colonoscopies. So it's really sad that when we build evidence and build confidence in in, in what works, uh, we don't rapidly uh, implement it so that we can save people like my dad. Here's a caution. A lot of the models that are really heavily hyped uh, and even put into compendiums like the IHI, a Better Care Playbook, have relatively weak evidence behind them. I personally reviewed the evidence for more than 100 care models that are on this playbook, which is it's a wonderful resource. And they all, every one of these models has an evidence rating that I basically gave it. There were very few with strong evidence, and I was pretty lenient with what I called strong. I, we derived it from the Cochrane Collaboration and other uh, sources, and very few had been replicated uh, successfully. So 
while we get all excited about this, especially in a technological age where they're coming at us so fast, we have to be mindful about what that level of evidence is. And there may be a reason why they don't replicate or scale easily. It may be because the evidence isn't that strong and the specifications for what is involved uh, in, these, uh, in these models are not uh, well described. So I think we can do uh, a little bit uh, better and the critical principle I want to talk now, and I hope you won't, won't get up and flock for the back door when I start talking about association not being the same as causality. Um, but when we act based on our findings of our, of our improvement programs, we tend to base our actions, in my experience, on association, not causation. And that may not be a bad thing, but it's always nice to be able to have some confidence that what we did actually caused the outcomes that we're seeing, and it's not just association. So here's a good example. There are increased crime rates in some uh, American uh, cities that are statistically associated with increase in ice cream sales. So clearly, ice cream sales cause, ice cream causes violence in, in the cities of America. Well, of course not. That's ludicrous, right? It's, it's an association, and there's a another variable, which happens to be warm, sunny days, that influences both of them. And as you'll see in a minute, that's a confounding factor. Uh, when it gets warm, people go out with get in trouble, and they eat a lot of ice cream. More seriously, smoking is associated with a higher probability of getting lung cancer. I'm sure you all believe that. The question was for a long time, is that an association or does cigarette smoking actually cause lung cancer? And I'll come back to that in just a minute. But I want to be sure, and I'll put a big box around this, be careful in attributing improved outcomes to your interventions or my interventions without formally considering how improvements we're claiming may not be causal and could even be, our, our assumptions and our claims could even be misleading and perhaps wrong. And being wrong when you're trying to save lives is not a good thing. So I'm going to be pretty persnickety about this association and causation because I really think uh, it matters. And we can be wrong in three fundamental ways. There may be others, but it's, I, I have driver diagram thinking, so there shouldn't be too many. But there are three main ways we can be wrong. And here they are. You know a lot about chance because we look at chance every time we do a run chart or statistical process control chart. We're trying to sort out real effects from random noise, right? That's special cause. That, that's what we do all the time. So you're familiar with that. Confounding and bias are the other two influences that can make our claims about associations being causal incorrect. So let's spend some time with those. First, confounding. A confounder. Uh, is something like, my patients are sicker, which we've all heard, case mix, uh, severity of illness. That would be a typical confounder. Why? Because it may influence, on the one hand, the exposure. The exposure is what we're uh, trying to do, what we're trying to implement, our improvement intervention, or it could be administering a drug to a patient. We tend to fix fixate on patients who are sicker and most in need of our help. So the exposure is influenced by that confounder. So is the outcome, because we know that sicker patients tend to have higher mortality, more readmissions or whatever. So the confounder is influ influencing both what we do and what the outcome is we're achieving. Is that clear? OK. So the properties of a confounder, it must be a cause or a risk factor for the outcome. It must be related to the exposure, but it must not be on the direct causal pathway between what the exposure is and what the outcome is. So for example, best, last time I looked as an infectious disease specialist, cholera is causal, I'm, I'm sorry, the cholera bacilli is causal to getting the clinical syndrome of cholera. You get a bacteria called cholera and you end up with rice water stool, and if you don't get oral rehydration therapy, you die. Clearly, contaminated water is not a confounder. It is on the causal pathway to getting cholera. So we wouldn't want to think of it as something we need to adjust for and get out of our analysis the way statisticians do. So that's the key difference. Confounder affects both the exposure and the outcome. An effect modifier or mediator is on the direct causal pathway, and we don't want to eliminate it from our thinking. So let's look at the smoking versus lung cancer. I, 
you know, it, it, there's this uh, uh, a great book called The Book of Why, which really goes into the history of this uh, at some length, and I didn't really appreciate all of it. Uh, but it used to be really controversial, as you know, and there's major uh, lawsuits and settlements over uh, tobacco causing lung cancer. R.A. Fisher was the architect of the randomized control trial, which I've abbreviated as RCT, which still in many people's minds is the gold standard of evidence. He argued, believe it or not, until his death, that there was a confounding factor, a cancer gene, that influenced both the tendency to smoke and the tendency to get lung cancer. And he, he, he was adamant, at, even as, as evidence became miles high, that there was this gene that was a confounder. Fortunately, Richard Dole, a great statistician, uh, and Austin Bradford Hill, one of the, another uh, great figure, uh, showed a clear association between smoking and cancer association in a case control study. So for those of you who don't remember what that is from uh, high school, uh, case control study merely means you have patients with uh, cancer and patients without cancer, and you compare them on whether or not they were exposed to the exposure of interest, which in this case is smoking. That's what a case control study is. Very clear, huge association in that case control study between smoking and cancer. People were worried that this still wasn't causality, and so the Surgeon General of the United States called together the great minds to figure out, well, what would we see that would tend to make us believe it was truly causal? Uh, and uh, these criteria were eventually defined in a 1965 paper by Austin Bradford Hill as the nine, they're now called nine Hills criteria. He didn't really like the idea that they were criteria because he didn't think they were for certain. He thought they were indicators or strong suggestions, uh, or, or as he put it, they were viewpoints, uh, not the sine qua non of causality. But they've really helped me and others in thinking about whether we're seeing an association or whether it's tending much more towards causality. Remember, we don't do molecular microbiology. Uh, and whole, whole genome sequencing in improvement. So using these kinds of uh, help, helpers in moving from association to causality is really important in our work. And here they are, and I'm just gonna read them through, and again, they're all posted, but these aren't uh, the rocket science. You're gonna recognize these as being very logical. Plausibility, does the postulated causal relationship make sense? So if I tell you that I have a theory uh, that watching less TV will reduce obesity in children, you're probably saying, well, that's a pretty good idea. That sounds plausible, but it's a little bit tenuous and you'd probably want to be really rigorous and do probably more than one careful study to establish that. Or the same thing wearing an Apple Watch or a Fitbit. Turns out, by the way, that wearing a Fitbit has, seems to have no effect, even though it seemed entirely plausible. Uh, so plausibility is really key. I've seen some really silly uh, major projects based on stuff that I look at and say, are you kidding me? So if you say, are you kidding me? That means you've got to be more rigorous in, in, your, in your design. Strength. Now by that, Austin Bradford Hill meant how big is the effect? Can you see it from the back of the room? Uh, Tom Nolan, who uh, regrettably one of the great fathers of IHI and improvement science, just passed on. And the one thing I remember most from what he told me is if you can't see it, Don, from the back of the room, it probably is not important. And I've seen many studies where there's statistical uh, special cause, but the improvement is 1.5% and the, and the rate of uh, adherence to the key process is only 30% overall. So he wanted to see something big, something important, recognizable. Consistency, do you see the same effect when you move to other settings or conditions? Temporality, and, and it, did the intervention actually occur before the outcome that we're seeing? And we get a little bit fuzzy with that sometimes in, in our work. We're not really precise about when we started our work and we tend to want to kind of claim things that are really uh, not uh, after what we did. Biological gradient's an important concept. So what do I mean by that? If we give more exposure or we do our intervention with higher fidelity or give a bigger dose, we would expect to see a bigger effect, right? And very rarely do we actually look at the dose response of what we're delivering in improvement and, and what's actually happening in outcomes. Sometimes if we look back, uh, the dose is something like a big educational program. I can tell you with absolute confidence, because the evidence is there, that this talk will change nothing uh, in your behavior when you go home, because education is a very weak uh, 
uh, link. Even though, I mean, I can jump up and down and be charismatic and tell jokes and it will not fundamentally change your behavior without a stronger dose, repeated education and other things being done. Coherence. Uh, do uh, existing theories and knowledge kind of support it? It's kind of related to plausibility, but if you think about it, a little different. Were experiments done? If you modify the intervention, did that lead to a different outcome? That's inherently the PDSA, of course. Uh, analogy, did the intervention work in other settings with similar results? Uh, it doesn't have to be identical, but analogous intervention, and I'll give you an example of that in a minute. And could anything else have produced the observed results? Uh, this is arguably the most important of all of these, and we're gonna spend a minute on, uh, uh, on that in a second. So how do I translate this into improvement science? Plausibility, that's the credible causal theory, uh, theory that we express in something like a driver diagram. It's our theory of change. Uh, and if that, uh, I think it was Cave, uh, the past editor of BMJ Quality and Safety, who said he rarely sees papers where there's a credible theory uh, put forward uh, at the start of the, of the publication. Strength, again, the magnitude of change. That's what we talk about when we say special cause, but not just is it statistically significant, was it important biologically? Consistency, did it occur? Uh, same change when we did it in a different context or conditions. If we do it in, uh, in uh, New York, do we, uh, do we see the same result in Chicago? Temporality, that's what run charts and statistical process control charts do if they're properly annotated. They show what we did, when we did it, and what happened afterwards. Biological gradient, we've uh, talked about the uh, activities, dose, and whether the dose was received and whether it was delivered with fidelity. PDSAs are experiment. An analogy is something like this. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with a kind of seminal study by Peter Pronovos on uh, central line associated bloodstream infections in Michigan. I'm gonna tell you more about that in a second. But the idea was it worked so well in Michigan, maybe it would also work on, on surgical site infection in, in Michigan. Or maybe it would work in England if you worked on central line associated uh, infection with the same methodology. In point of fact, when the same kind of methodology was used for surgical site infections in Michigan, the same sponsoring organizations, there was no change. And in fact, when the Keystone project was brought to England, uh, the NHS, to try and reduce collapses, there was no effect. So analogy is, can be really instructive. So here is now taking Peter Pronovo's Keystone study and applying Austin Bradford Hill's criteria to help you think about whether you truly believe that his Keystone project was causal. Well, it's certainly plausible uh, that if you do these evidence-based things to prevent collapse, like big drape and using uh, chlorhexidine on the site, um, that's all plausible, I'll buy that. He, he saw a pretty large effect, 66% reduction in the average uh, rate, and the median uh, actually went to zero in that project. It was consistent, was seen in 103 ICUs. That's the, actually to me the most impressive thing, 103 ICUs saw the same uh, trend or effect. There was clearly temporality, but uh, sorry, Peter, you didn't put it in a time order data I could understand. Uh, you did a generalized linear latent and mixed model in six, three month period, which is like some big black box that I don't really get. So uh, I give him a little ding for that. Uh, biological gradient wasn't specified. I have no idea reading his papers what the dose was and how well it was received. Uh, it was consistent with available evidence, so there was coherence. He did a, a, some experiments, different centers, did things in different sequence, and they were doing PDSA cycles, so I'll buy that there was experimentation. But analogy failed when applied to surgical site infection and in England with the uh, NHS, and there was no comparison group. People have a tendency to say, oh, that was a randomized trial. Uh, the surgical checklist, uh, Atul Gawande's very famous paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, I actually myself refer to as a randomized control trial. No, it wasn't. There was no uh, what I call counterfactual. And now, so let's talk about that big word, counterfactual. What is a counterfactual and why is it important in design and evaluation? It's a comparison between what actually happened and what would have happened in the absence of the intervention. It's a what if question. What if I had not intervened in my ICU? What if I had not taken aspirin for my headache? What if I hadn't smoked? Would the same thing have happened if I hadn't done uh, what I did? And this brings up what is one of my personal problems I have sometimes with improvement. 
Uh, we tend to talk about bright spots, and I'm really happy. You can learn a ton from bright spots. But we should always ask our question, were there bright spots in areas where we didn't do what we did? So we worked in a bunch of communities, and there were some great bright spots. Did we look in 20 other communities where we had not intervened and see if there are the same kind of bright spots there? Were there dark spots, people, communities that didn't do any improvement uh, with our big intervention? And was that any different than in places uh, where we weren't working? So <laughs> this is, again, working with a counterfactual, what if? You see, I'm getting really excited, so I'm getting hoarse. <clears throat> so here's really exciting stuff. Bias uh, is systematic error or deviation from truth, and we're all really interested in truth these days in my country, introduced during design, subject selection, project implementation, data collection, or analysis. All of those steps are subject to bias. So uh, I have given you a reference here for the Cochrane Handbook on Systematic Reviews of Interventions, which has a bias checklist. And I'm not going to cover all these because it's just too pointy-headed to give you a whole lecture on bias. So I put in green five important sources of bias uh, that ought to be considered in most improvement projects. First, selection bias. We know who tends to sign up for this stuff, or we may even seek out people that we think are going to be most enthusiastic to do the work, or they really want to work with us, or sometimes they may just want to give us a check. But that's a selection bias. That is not a representative group of everybody who might have participated, and they tend to be very enthusiastic about QI. Performance bias. If you sign up for a collaborative, you're going to work harder, darn it. Especially if you're a team that's traveled to meetings three times a year, you're going to really work hard, and that is not real life. That's a bias. Detection or ascertainment bias. Enthusiasts look higher, harder for the data that supports their work. That's why sometimes in major projects that really are programs, we have an external evaluator with all the problems that that raises because we know that people have a lot of trouble with an unbiased look uh, at their own data. Attrition bias, when we do major improvement work, uh, wards or sites or hospitals or people tend to drop out over time because they don't think it's working for them or they're bored or wh whatever it is. And that is a source of bias because we then have to account for them in our analysis, which is really hard to do. And finally, of course, reporting or publication bias because we like to spread good news and the BMJ quality and safety in general likes to publish things that show uh, great results. And, and you can read about those other types of bias. I really hope you will. It's actually really informative and a wonderful uh, resource. So Sue Wells, who was a Harkness Fellow from uh, New Zealand, who worked with me and some others, uh, we looked at all of the publications on the so-called IHI Breakthrough Series Collaborative. Uh, and there were a lot of publications we looked at. Trust me, I, I must have read 40 or 50 papers. Uh, and we, we tried to apply the criteria that are generally accepted in the world from the Cochrane Collaboration and in the quality improvement uh, field from Squire 2.0 for what a good publication ought to look like uh, in quality improvement. And most of these studies, we were really great, glad to see, showed substantial improvement, more than a 50% improvement in the things they said they wanted to improve. And that's really encouraging. The trouble was that apart from publication bias, which almost certainly exists, fewer than a third met established criteria for quality of study, and most of the problems were around failure to even articulate, let alone deal with bias. It was really dispiriting. One of the leading improvement scientists at IHI, Lloyd Provost, when I said, good news, you know, they're really improving, uh, he said, yeah, uh, that, that's great, except you told me that uh, two-thirds of the studies were fundamentally uh, biased. So something to really think about uh, when we're publishing our work. So a worthy goal for improvers, why don't we design studies that will determine if observed effects can be attributed uh, to QI interventions, right? That sounds easy. Uh, we could give a whole hour on design and evaluation. I'm just going to give some highlights which I think will be, uh, hope will be helpful. First of all, there are many designs to choose from. I put in green again the three that are, I think, most useful in quality improvement. Gareth is uh, an author of a superb publication that I even highlighted and bolded down below, which goes through this in depth and is online. It's free. It's a wonderful resource. So cluster randomized control trials I'm going to talk about, step wedge, and interrupted time series. First of all, a lot of the scientists you talk to, the academics will say, you didn't do a randomized controlled trial, you didn't have the gold standard of evidence, I don't believe your findings. 
you ought to be prepared with the, how many are there here, seven reasons why our uh, randomized control trials may not be appropriate for your work. First, randomization may not be ethical. You couldn't randomize people to smoking or non-smoking, just a crude example. They're expensive and take forever. They cost in the U.S. millions of dollars and you get a, a, an answer four years later by which time everything's moved on and there are new ways of doing things. They're not really that generalizable because there are really strict inclusion and ex uh, exclusion criteria that don't represent the whole population. In the United States, it, it's really unusual to have a randomized trial that accurately represents blacks and Hispanics and old people. Other than that, they're really generalizable, right? Except they don't deal with uh, a, a large segment of our population. Uh, the control group may be inadvertently exposed to the intervention. You remember the Merit trial in Australia on uh, rapid response teams, uh, which showed no effect. Well, the intervention had already bled into the comparison control uh, hospitals because the word was on the street that this was a good thing to do. Uh, there's attrition bias. People, organizations drop out. We used fixed protocols in general randomized control trials. We followed those protocols to the death three years of fixed protocol, when we know from everything we do in improvement that adaptation is absolutely key. The rate of outcomes of interest very often is less than was predicted by the people who funded the study. Uh, leading, again, that happened in the merit trial on, on rapid response team, much lower rate of events uh, than they had predicted, so the statistical ability to show an effect was markedly reduced. So there's a movement now to real-time learning and adaptation randomized trials and cluster randomized trials where you enable the investigators to go into the intervention group when they see that there's not adequate fidelity and uptake and penetration of the design intervention to help them actually get it up to a level where they might see a difference. We did a uh, 19 uh, ICU study in the United States, cluster randomized trial, uh, of screening for MRSA to see if it would reduce transmission and infection. Uh, and when we looked at the intervention arm over time, we could see hand hygiene, wearing a gown, all the stuff you know and believe was inadequately being done, even in a protocol situation. But we were not allowed to go in there and help them improve their adherence to these fundamental things. Screening is never going to work if you're slobbering filth on your hands and going from patient to patient. So uh, it does raise statistical power issues when you adapt. Uh, it, it, uh, you obviously have issues with statisticians, but I'd rather adapt than uh, go three years and have a, a protocol that doesn't work. Uh, step wedge trial is really useful in quality improvement. Now, as you look at this, you see blue squares and white squares. What happens here is you introduce your intervention uh, in a piecemeal fashion. Let's say these are uh, six groups or they could be wards in a hospital. Uh, you have a baseline period, then you introduce it in one ward and then you introduce it in another ward and by the end of the time period, all six wards have gotten the intervention. This allows you to compare over time the white boxes with the blue boxes. So there's a natural comparison group here uh, and to look over time to see whether there's been a change uh, over time. And this is really a useful method. Uh, in general, you want to randomize these groups, but it may not be possible, and I would be happy, frankly, uh, if you had a, this kind of design with at least a comparison group to show you what would happen in those wards where intervention didn't occur, the counterfactual, the big if question. And Gareth is behind me, and miraculously, I'm actually finished. So it all, it all worked out great. Thank you, Gareth. <laughs>
I sometimes get the feeling that to healthcare, the goal of healthcare is to deliver healthcare. Whereas we patients want to use healthcare as a means to reach our goal, which is health. And as this slide shows as well, <laughs> thank you. And of course, healthcare is very important to health, but it's not the only thing that's important to health, as you can see in this slide. And as well as research being a supporting factor to all these different parts of, of health. And my research and work is focused on, on using scientific methods uh, the way Don, Don described it so well, to support the work that we patients do every day to manage our conditions on a day-to-day -day basis. We're going to flip. So uh, I, I've had Parkinson's disease for over, th over 30 years, close to 35 years, and I trained to be an engineer. And I worked uh, for 14 years in environmental risk assessment and scenario analysis. But then 10 years ago, I decided that I wanted to combine my engineering skills with my patient experiences. And I decided I wanted to help others and myself by trying to improve things in chronic disease management. And some of you have, might have seen this slide that I showed two years ago when I spoke at this conference. Or maybe you've seen it somewhere else. This slide has been at places I haven't been, so it's used frequently around the world. But it shows how, how little time I actually spend in neurological specialty healthcare compared to how much time I spend managing my condition myself. And then I also, at that time, two years ago when I spoke at this conference, I also briefly touched upon what, the work I've done with trying to optimize my treatment. Let's see, this doesn't... Hmm, can you switch to the next slide, please? Thank you. I, I showed this slide as well, and I, I'm going to explain it a bit more in this, in this time around when I'm here. Uh, this slide shows, I was inspired by a doctoral thesis I came across using um, finger function as a, as a proxy for medication effect in Parkinson's disease. So they had used a finger tapping test to optimize treatment in, uh, uh, advanced treatment in Parkinson's disease in the clinic. So I thought that I could use that myself in my own day-to-day -to -day management. So what I did was I found a, a finger tapping app on my smartphone, uh, and, and I, started, I, I used it several times over the course of the day, tapping with my right hand and left hand respectively for 30 seconds, and the, the app counted how many taps I could make in the, that time, showing then how, how fast my fingers were moving compared to different times. And I also added my medication intakes that you can see in the bars here. And I found, I didn't know what I was going to find when I started, but I found this dip in function over lunch. That to me indicated that I, 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 the medications were too far apart in time. So I moved the, the, the medication intake at, that I had at 11.30, I moved it to 11. And as a result, I had a more even effect of my medication. This, this I did already as long ago as 2012. And I try, I've tried to publish it several times, but it's different, difficult to publish these kind of studies because it's, not, it's, not usual, it's very unusual for research. But uh, uh, eventually, actually last year, I was able to get it published the third time around that I tried uh, in, the, in a journal called the Journal of Parkinson's Disease or under the umbrella of precision medicine. Because in my opinion, precision medicine takes also, it, it, of course it includes genetic and, and what have you, testing, but it also includes active patients, especially in chronic disease. And, and I also, I want to talk a bit more about the context of Parkinson's disease. It's, an, it's a neurodegenerative condition with extremely individualized manifestations. Uh, it's usually said that if you've seen one person with Parkinson's disease, you've seen one person with Parkinson's disease. <laughs> and I've literally met probably over a thousand individuals with Parkinson's disease myself, and not, none of us have exactly the same symptomology or exactly the same medication combinations. So it's a very individual disease, and the different medications work different well, differently on different people. And I, I use a lot of self-tracking, and, and I, I define self-tracking 
as any form of data collection, observation, or experiment made by an individual with or without the use of technology, because you can also do it using pen and paper very effectively and, and well, works really well. But concerning aspects that are relating to their own health or disease. So self-tracking has to do with your own management of some, some sort of observations of your own condition or, or state in the way. But I also have defined patient-driven N01, because since, it, since I noticed that it's rarely disseminated in academic published publications, I, 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 we chose to define the, the word patient-driven N01 as self-tracking, performed with the explicit intention to disseminate results in academic journals. And for this next study I'm, I will talk to you about, I, I, you, you also need to know what level dopa-induced dyskinesias are. So level dopa-induced dyskinesias are, are a, a very common side effect of Parkinson's disease medication, but it's a, uncomfortable and often very difficult to manage. So if anyone has seen Michael J. Fox on TV, for instance, you, you will notice he, 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 he can't really sit still. So he sort of flops around and he can't see, he flaps, flaps his arms and, and, and sort of wags his feet. And that is dyskinesia. It's a, it's a reaction to the medication that we take to, to manage our conditions. And as you have the disease longer and longer, it will be more, the, the therapeutic window will, will grow smaller and smaller. So it's a very difficult c c side effect, very difficult to manage. It's, it's socially awkward and can be very, very hard for the person to, ma to, to, de to li live with. So uh, having this in mind, I, I wanted to, so I came across a, a video of a fellow person with Parkinson's on social media. And she had used very effectively uh, nicotine from an e-cigarette to manage her, her dyskinesias. So I designed and, and, and conducted a study, placebo-controlled study, to, to see, to explore the effects of nicotine on dyskinesias, using myself as a research subject. And that was one aim with the study. The other aim of the study was to, to, to identify and describe some of the challenges included with, when, you try, when you do patient-driven N01, meaning studies that have the explicit intent to, be, to publish academically self-tracking. So the study was conducted and the signing conducted by me and, and a few others were, were involved in pilot data as well. But the data published in this article are, is, is all, are, are, are all mine. And the results from this study, now, yeah, that, that works, yeah. So I found that nicotine, when I, when I, did, when I deliberately induced this can ease on myself by taking slightly too much medication. Uh, and I used the nicotine from the e-cigarette to see if I could manage it. I found in the placebo-controlled study that, I, that it, ha it may have, it, it had an effect on me. So it means it may also have a beneficial effect on other people with Parkinson's disease. But this was only an N01, so I mean, I only know about myself. But there, have, there, there were people trying it before me and based on the study, I know that people anecdotally have, have, have shared that they, they, they have tried themselves with a bit of mixed results. So it, it always comes down to, does it work for me or not? And then the other aim of the study, looking at challenges in, uh, concerning patient-driven N01. There are lots of challenges with this, and of course, as, as academic publishing is, is a tricky business, and you have to know there's a lot you have to know to, to be able to, to do it. And especially for self-tracking, since it's difficult to find ways of publishing it to start with. It's not easy to, to publish it when you want to, want to do it in N01 as well. But the challenges include, for example, planning, re finding a research team to work with, data collection, analysis, writing the, the results in a good way, and finding a good journal is not the easiest thing either to, to want, that would want to publish. You have to frame it in a way that, that it fits the, the scope of the journal, which is, there isn't really any journal out there publishing self-tracking as, as a rule. Uh, but from these two studies that I've made, there are several conclusions that can be, can, that can be drawn. One being that 
I knew this, but now so I sort of have, have more evidence of it, on it as well, especially since I've also tried to publish it. That we patients do a lot of work on a daily basis to understand and manage our conditions. For example, self-tracking or trying things for ourselves and sharing with, with our fellow patients. But since these efforts are rarely disseminated in academic publications, they don't reach medical professionals in clinical practice and aren't therefore tested and taken further in, in a validated form or even acknowledged in a way. Because if, if it doesn't, in a way, if it's not published, it doesn't really exist in healthcare in a way. So, I, and I, as far as I know, I'm one of the few. There's, there's at most a handful of patients trying to publish in this area. And I think there's a lot of potential in this to, to, to improve for, for a lot of other patients. And I want to emphasize that it's, I, I find it very important to separate method from intervention. So just because these specific in, interventions have worked for me, it doesn't mean they will work for someone else, even if they have Parkinson's disease as well. But the methods of how I, uh, how I work with this, how, how I find my way forward in, in this complex and very complicated disease and managing the day-to-day -day basis on a, on a neurodegenerative disease. I think the methods I use and others use would benefit a lot from having more people work with them and, and try them, test them, and see, uh, scrutinize them simply. And you might, you might even call this everyday science because the everyday management of chronic conditions, chronic disease, is a very complicated thing. And a lot of them, uh, if patients get more support in this area, I think there's a lot to be won for healthcare altogether. And I, I, I have made this slide just to demonstrate that th it, there, there, there are gains to be made on all levels of this. From people, people, PWP means people with Parkinson's in this case, but it can be any patient really with a complex condition. And how we, we can gain individual knowledge f on self-care and finding individual patterns, but also on a population or group level, you can find similarities between different patients and anomalies that you can base research on and, and, and build further on. Uh, and, and, and then you can explore things and find new new ways of treating diseases, new, new ways of managing diseases in, in lots of ways. And this, of course, is important since already 50% of populations of the population has one or more chronic diseases, and 25% have two or more. So already there are more who, are, who, are, who have multiple chronic conditions than have only one. And I want to close by, by quoting Donald Ber Don Berwick reminding us all that healthcare is, is best work, works best when it's a guest in patients' lives rather than patients being guests in healthcare. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, that, was, that was fantastic. Um, I think we've got time for a, 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 maybe for a couple of questions, which I was kind of curious, just, just having listened to you both. I mean, um, you're both published authors, you're both, I guess, published academics. Um, I'm kind of thinking, when you're writing a paper, um, who do you sort of think of as your audience when you're writing? Um, and what is it that you kind of want them to do, or maybe not do, <laughs> as a result of what you're, you're writing? Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, of course, ad academic publishing, academic papers are primarily for academics. But I, I know that a lot of patients read academic journals in an increasing amount since more and more is published open science, open, open access. So I, I write for academics, but I hope that I can also at the same time change the way academics see patients and, and also help patients get into the academic world in a bit. In a way. Well, you know, I'm an academic, so just to get the titles on the slide and all that stuff, you've got to go through all this publishing bit. Um, I think it's vastly overemphasized as a reason to advance people professionally. Uh, but one of the main reasons, I think, for improvers to want to publish 
is that if, you're, if you publish a good paper in a good journal, it is in fact uh, picked up by people who will help you spread the word. Uh, you know, uh, Atul Gawande publishes checklists in the New England Journal. Sanjeev Arora, who's the architect of Project Echo that's now a global way to train people virtually, published a paper on hepatitis C treatment in the New England Journal. And both of those led to incredible publicity and then additional studies to show when and how and if those uh, modalities work elsewhere. And that's really gratifying to see. Uh, we are living in an era where other modes of dissemination are perfectly fine, I mean, in fact, desirable. Uh, you know, there are less rigorous peer review processes, there's the web, there's all kinds of ways to get information out. My only plea would be don't, sa don't sacrifice quality of the work to get into some journal that is easier to get into. Uh, I, I think rigor is important no matter where. It, you know, stuff gets picked up and spread. I showed you those models on the playbook. It gets picked up and it gets spread and people talk about it and talk about it. When you go back to the original evidence, you don't find it's there and then people throw up their hands and they say, well, it's not working. Uh, so uh, I, I think basic principles of rigor are always important. I, I do want to say one, one thing that, if I may, Gareth, I, I think you exemplify how when patients are involved in work, the work is better. But, but, uh, there's this invitation that needs to be made. I, I have, we have patients sitting in our health services research fellowship training program, uh, work in progress, where the research is being debated, improved, and so forth, and always the research is improved. And, and the patients love it and feel accepted, and we love it and we feel accepted. It's a wonderful giving and sharing. So I, I just want to thank you for that. Thank you, thank you. And I'm also just kind of thinking, in terms of something, some scientific study you've read or been a part of or, or, or been aware of, um, can you describe one where you've kind of gone, oh, that, that's great, and I'm now going to do something different as a result of that, maybe? I'm just wondering if there's something which you've kind of looked for when you're, when you're looking at scientific studies. Can you say it again? No, yeah, I'm thinking if, if, there's a, if there's an example of a scientific study or even an improvement study where you've gone, oh, that's really interesting. I'm now going to think about doing something differently as a result of reading that paper or that. Oh, you mean, paper. does it actually, do people care <laughs> about what you wrote? And do they? <laughs> I'm just wondering if there's been any, if there's, if there's a study which you've read which you've now gone, okay, I'm going to do something different as a result of that. Yeah. So I could say that RCTs are, of course, the gold standard of, of, of the highest quality of, 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 of research evaluation. But I'm not sure that that always is the best way of demonstrating what works in, in a lot of people. So I'm thinking that maybe we need to be open to other ways of evaluating. And, and, and Gareth, uh, you taught me actually, I think, uh, the phrase, use a design that's fit for purpose. Uh, and I, I think as you're saying, there are many ways to design studies that will provide a reasonable degree of evidence uh, and uh, improve uh, your credibility. Uh, so uh, it should be fit for purpose. And you also taught me that never separate design and evaluation. You'll notice that when I was talking about all these concepts, the, the idea that somebody's going to evaluate and that you're designing are totally intermingled. So a good way to do this, I found, is to imagine somebody evaluating or you're in a cocktail party and your arch skeptic is there and design your study fit for a purpose so that you can at least be persuasive about why you did what you did as the best solution to, uh, to the problem. And I think that I th I actually helps. I thought it was so helps. interesting you told us that, that the evaluation, the, the studies done on, on causation of smoking uh, or lung cancer and smoking, the, 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 the relationships, that the man who actually did the study what, didn't believe in it, in the results himself. I thought that was so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to bring this session to an end. I think this has been fascinating, thought-provoking, and, and challenging. So I just want to say thank you to our speakers once more. Thank you.